Hello and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, our first rundown of 2023. Today is January 4th and you are getting sleepy, very sleepy. You're walking through a meadow because it's National Hypnotism Day, among other things. My name is Tom Hollingsworth and I am the uh, the hypnotist in residence here at Gestalt IT. Uh, joining me is uh, my co-host for this episode, Mr. Chris Reed. Chris, uh, welcome to 2023. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and I thought I was being sleepy just because we were coming back from break. Well, you know, that is the, the case. We're, uh, we're winding up. You know, the news stories seem to be a little quieter than usual this time. I don't know if that had anything to do uh, with everybody just deciding we've had enough of the year and, and taking a whole bunch of time off. But we do have a few stories, uh, especially since it's CES week. Um, you might say that they're very uh, trivial in nature since it is National Trivia Day also. Um, but Chris, I'm going to go ahead and jump in because uh, one company that did not have a good holiday break was the IT staff over at The Guardian, which is a UK publication that we do often quote here at The Rundown. Uh, per reports, The Guardian Media Group was hit with a ransomware attack on December 20th, shortly before Christmas, and they've been trying to recover their assets, but to no avail. Mandiant, who was pulled in to help things out, has sourced the attack to a Chinese ransomware crew. And they were indicating that there could potentially be some intelligence aspects and espionage to the whole thing. So very spooky things going on. Um, the Guardian says that their offices are going to be offline until at least January 23rd and that the Wi-Fi was impacted in the attack. However, their print services don't appear to be uh, impacted at all, which means that while you may not be able to read The Guardian online, you can probably go pick up a copy of it at your local newsstand. Um, Chris? What do you think about the fact that The Guardian managed to get themselves targeted by a Chinese intelligence operation? I mean, uh, so I, I think that the, the the Chinese intelligence operations was actually towards uh, News Corp and not the um, not The Guardian. That was a February, February I think, 2022 um, attack on News Corp. Uh, so the, the ransomware attack at, at The Guardian, um, I, honestly, it's not surprising for any any company at this point to be hit by ransomware. Um, and it seemed like the Guardian followed a playbook uh, that they uh, not sure on the timelines of how things happen. So how quickly they followed the playbook, but uh, but they shut down network services. Um, they sent staff home. Um, they developed some alternate means of, of continuing to publish, at least online. Um, and uh, they're continuing to keep things shut down until they recover. So uh, not surprising that it's happened and not surprising that they're uh, it's taken a while for them to get back. I will say the other thing, too, is the fact that it's going to take a month for them to recover from this attack. And like you said, they did everything right. That should give you an idea of how long it's going to take for you to recover from a ransomware attack. And that's just if you get hit by one of the things that's easy to get rid of. I, yeah, And that's if you're prepared. You've run through. You've got executive buy-in on actually shutting down the network when things like this happen. Um, it's, uh, it is a long recovery process for all of these. Uh, so just in time for the holidays, Okta got a lump of coal in the form of a breach of their GitHub repository for source code. The intrusion appears to have been targeted at the Workforce Identity Cloud solution, and an automated tool was able to access and dump the code. GitHub declined to offer details on how the code was accessed, but assured users that customer data was not impacted and Auth0 products were not affected. This attack comes on the heels of Okta being breached by Lapsus earlier in 2022. Uh, Tom, what do you think about this latest snafu for Okta? This is going to be like a cavalcade of breaches and, and intrusions and stuff in 2023, which follows from everything that happened in 2022. Uh, this popped up right before the break. In fact, I even made a note to myself in our in our planning doc. I'm like, this is going to be important when we get back. Ironically enough, it hasn't gotten a lot of press. And I don't know if that's because it was kind of low impact, which I don't really believe, because as we saw with the last pass uh, issues that happened uh, late last year, you know, the August breach ended up becoming the November and December, like massive problem. Uh, and Okta is not the, a stranger to having their stuff uh, zapped. I mean, Lapsus, one of their first targets was Okta. And so that's one of the things that I worry that people downplay these things more than they should. They don't realize that the biggest problem is not the first breach. It's whether or not that breach was allowing them to get a foothold. So yeah, Okta's saying all the right things. You know, customer data wasn't impacted, so they didn't steal your credit card numbers, they didn't steal any of your, you know, schemes or whatever. Auth0 is completely unaffected by this, which tells me that they still haven't integrated those two development pipelines yet if Auth0 was somehow um, uh, avoided being breached. However, here's the problem. If you have the source code to this solution, 
which wasn't open source because companies don't do that, they can pick over it at their heart's content and they can find all kinds of crazy exploits to be able to get back into Okta systems. And given the fact that Okta powers a lot of identity management, that should give people pause. The right thing for Okta to do is to come out and say, you know, this is what got breached. Uh, if you're using these tools, we're going to issue patches. We're going to work hand in hand with you to keep a very close eye on what happened to make sure that you're not getting breached in very less visible ways. Because that's the other thing, too. If you think about the fact that this effectively can fuel a whole bunch of zero day attacks now, that is a massive win for people who are going to, I don't know, attempt to create other multi-stage types of exploits to be able to get into other systems. And you can better believe that if a company like Google or Cisco or Tesla or whoever gets breached through Okta, Okta is going to be on the hook if it later comes out that the exploit was developed thanks to the theft of the source code. So I, I want to throw this out there for every company in 2023. Stop beating around the bush. Stop trying to protect yourself from a potential FTC lawsuit or keep your stock price from falling. Be honest. Yeah, our stuff got taken. Yeah. Here's what we're worried about. Let's figure out how to prevent this from happening. You know, take a, play, a page out of the playbook of a kindergartner. Apologize for what happened and make it better. Don't try to be coy about it and go, well, it really wasn't that bad. No, you're right. It wasn't until it becomes bad. All right, uh, Chris, it's CES week. You know, our favorite week of the year that brings us things like $7,000 front doors and built-in cameras, toilets that test our um, byproducts to uh, find out all kinds of cool things. And of course, everything AR and VR, right? But that's all consumer tech news. I mean, if I wanted to buy the latest Intel chip, I know where to go. But there was some enterprise news from our friends over at HP. HP, because they have uh, decided to jump into the headphone competition market with the new Poly Voyager Free 60. Now, you probably think to yourself, why does HP want to compete against AirPods? Well, this is an enterprise grade headset and it has a really cool feature on it that I'm sure that at least three CEOs out there are going to be interested in. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit more about this cool thing? I, so this is actually a, a genuinely interesting product. Uh, so uh, instead of just a regular charging case, uh, the plus line of this, there's a normal one and then there's the plus line. The plus line has a little uh, OLED screen on it that can uh, accept or reject calls. You can swap between devices with it, uh, control volume. And then in addition, there's a three and a half millimeter uh, listen only input on it. So you can hook it up to in-flight uh, entertainment system. This seems to be the uh, the spiritual successor to some of those travel uh, conference phones that had the little screen on it and the, and the tiny little, little speaker. Um, so it seems like instead of just getting into uh, the AirPods market, they're, they've actually added a few novel features that uh, that no one else appears to have. Uh, in addition, the Plus line, uh, they have been certified, whatever that means, for Zoom, Meet, Voice, and Teams. So uh, you can check those boxes if you're uh, enterprise, uh, if you're purchasing for enterprise groups. Yeah, I think that this is an interesting tack because we have seen this before from a lot of companies that are trying to jump in on this market. You know, hey, we've got a solution that is a little bit more work focused. And I remember that because I don't know if you realize it or not, but over there in that corner, I still have a Cisco Cius, you know, the iPad killer, the thing that's going to revolutionize the way that we do unified communications for about three months and then it got killed. So I hope that Poly is able to sell a lot of these to people who are looking for that kind of hybrid model of on the road communications, or I mean, even setting it up here in an office, but realistically speaking, I don't know how much further they're going to get, especially if it is enterprise priced, which is usually what happens, because most people are going to go, wait, it costs how much? Well, I'll just go spend $250 on a set of AirPods and be done. That's the that's the tough part is the price point compared to the AirPods. While it may have a couple of features that you might like, uh, is that if you're purchasing, how do you justify that that uplift? I think we're going over to Nutanix again. It, it seems like every week we've got a Nutanix story <laughs> within Rundown. Uh, but in a follow-up uh, to one brought last month, it appears that the interest that HPE was showing in Nutanix is less hot than it looked. Reports have surfaced that say HPE is no longer in talks with Nutanix, and HPE confirmed that there are no ongoing discussions with the company. This comes after Nutanix stock rose 25% after the initial reports back in October that the hyperconverged giant was looking to sell to a prospective buyer. 
Stock price comes down a bit since mid-December after the announcement that HPE isn't interested. Tom, what does this mean for Nutanix and who's buying them now? Well, so before we get started in the story, I do have to make a mea culpa. Uh, in a story that we covered this in last month, I uh, I read out that uh, Diraj Pandey, the former CEO of Nutanix, had been forced out uh, late, uh, last year. That is incorrect. As Diraj reminded me on uh, through Twitter, he was not forced out. He chose to leave. And that is totally fine. So Diraj, I apologize. I did not mean to insinuate that they fired you. You definitely chose to leave. And I think that that kind of speaks to what we're starting to see here. Now, you remember last month, those halcyon days of like three weeks ago, when Stephen and I were sitting here going, this is an amazing pickup. This would be a great deal. This makes a whole lot of sense, which is naturally why nobody has bothered to even run the run this thing out to where it needs to be. And I know that I'm going to make a lot of people mad when I say this, but good God, man, what are you waiting for? Like, are you expecting the clouds to open up and the money to rain down from heaven? Like, I don't understand why nobody is wanting to kind of, you know, tell the emperor they have new clothes, no clothes on or whatever. Now, as a reminder, Diraj is long gone from Nutanix. He's off doing something cool on his own. This is the team that came in after him. And almost from the get, the, the, the talks were, what are they going to do? Are they going to be acquired? Are they going to, um, you know, are they, well, how are they going to exit from this? And I think that that speaks a lot. When you have a guy like Diraj, who's very growth oriented, who's very much ready to go out there and say, I'm going to take on the world no matter what. When you shift focus to somebody else who maybe doesn't have that same mindset, it narrows the focus in the window of what your capabilities are going to be. Now, the stock price jumped like 25% back in October. And it's actually come down. Like I was looking at the start, stock price graph. It, it shot up and then about mid-December, it started cooling off a little bit, which means that at least by mid-December, people were starting to hear maybe this is, there's not as much here as they had originally thought. And that makes me wonder now what the exit strategy is going to be. And I'll tell you that in the Seeking Alpha story that we linked to, which has some of the notes on this, the comment section is hilarious because you've got huge Nutanix proponents on one side talking about how they're revolutionizing the game and changing the way that we consume infrastructure. And on the other side, you've got your usual snarky internet trolls who are like, oh, I'm so glad HPE didn't decide to spend money on this company that's basically a whole bunch of uh, you know shell scripts that are doing wacky stuff on the back end. And the, as always, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. But the question is, how close to the middle does it lie? And here's the other thing that we brought up that I think is an even bigger question that you have to ask. How much is Nutanix going to be effective in a world where everybody seems hell-bent on going to the cloud? I understand that hybrid cloud and private cloud are still very big things that a lot of specific companies need, whether there's you know, highly regulated environments or very sp uh, specific requirements for data protection. But as more and more companies winnow down what they need that cloud spend for, and what they need on-premises spend for, I think what you're going to find is that that market's going to shrink. And hey, if Nutanix wants to be the king of that market, I am totally fine with that. But our Nutanix shareholder is going to be fine with that. And that's the biggest problem that we're going to run into here. When you have a company that is being driven by the, the market and saying, you guys need to find an exit as your stock price slowly starts slipping down, how desperate are they going to be? I mean, the stories of, you know, oh, you know, Nutanix turned down acquisitions from companies like Cisco and others back in 2016. Yeah, six years ago was an entirely different world than we're living in right now. I think that ultimately we're going to look back on this in, I don't know, eight months and go, hey, remember when HPE could have paid a lot for Nutanix and Nutanix could have got a lot of value out of it? And we'll just be kind of like, yeah, Pepperidge Farm remembers, because I don't think the situation is going to be nearly as rosy for them come September or October of 2023. I, yeah, I mean, ultimately, they've got if, if they've got a dwindling market uh, that they've got to do something, they either have to get acquired or they need to find new market, new product for them to, to grow into. So uh, they've got to make a decision. They've got to do something. Uh, they can't just continue to do what they've been doing. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. But thankfully, you've always got the rundown every week 
Um, speaking of weeks, uh, we've got a, a few things happening this week and, and in the coming weeks that you'll want to know about. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, but it is CES week happening this week. So if you uh, are interested in any kind of consumer technology, you're definitely going to want to check it out. There's a ton of news that's dropping every morning. So be sure you're, you're tuned into that. January 18th through the 20th is Networking Field Day 30. It's our first Tech Field Day event of 2023. I'll be in Silicon Valley with a great lineup of companies and a great lineup of delegates. If you want to check them out, head over to the website, techfieldday.com. While you're there, please make sure you mark your calendars for Cloud Field Day 16, which will be happening January 25th and 26th. Uh, Stephen Foskett has a great lineup of presenters there as well. And as always, the rundown will be back on Wednesday, uh, 12.30 Eastern Time, uh, publication on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gestalt IT video. You can also subscribe to us in your favorite podcast of choice. If you uh, are trying to get out there and, uh, you know, get fit for the new year and you need something to listen to, to drive you on a little bit faster, why not listen to the dulcet tones of our voice, uh, reading you the latest tech news. Um, if nothing else, you'll, you'll want to get moving faster so that you can get on to the next part of your podcast that is a little more entertaining. But uh, we will be back with more great tech news as more uh, people come back to the office. Hopefully there are no meltdowns like we had last year from Amazon. But uh, if there is, you can better believe that we will be here uh, to cover it. Uh, Chris, if people want to find out a little bit more about some of the cool stuff that you're working on, where can they go to do that? Uh, you can mostly find me on Twitter uh, at the CM Reed. And uh, as you can follow us on Twitter, we are at Gestalt IT. Just use the hashtag rundown. Uh, we're always looking for cool stories, uh, coverage of uh, interesting things in the news. Uh, we just don't cover Twitter and iPhones. Like everything else, we're pretty much open to. Uh, but beyond that, we will see you next week for another great episode. Thanks for tuning in and uh, take care. Bye.